My cousins. On Thursdays in Paris, children don't have to go to school. That is the day I visit my cousins, the ones who live near the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery. Mama never says so, but I know these cousins are poor. They don't have a toilet in their apartment like we do. All they have is a stinky room with a hole in the ground, way down the hall from their apartment. They have to share with other families, too. One Thursday, I try to sneak down the narrow back streets that lead to my cousin's apartment. I stay away from the soldiers who strut along the avenues. But I do have to cross one big street. I hold my breath. When I pass in front of the motorcycles, cars, and trucks, on the other side, a soldier darts out of the bakery right in front of me, eating an eclair. I almost bump into him. Startled, I jump back for an instant, then recover. I try to look calm as I walk toward the passe, Passage de Amandir, but inside, my heart still pounds. Past the bakery, I enter that dim alley. It smells like cooked cabbage and urine. Babies scream, workers hammer, women yell. No soldiers can be seen, but I'm still afraid. Anything can happen in a neighbor like this, neighborhood like this. But above the den, I hear the sweet sound of my cousin, Sir Hayes' violin. I follow it to safety. I'm always hungry to hear Sir Hayes' music. We never listen to music at home. Jews had to hand over their radios to the police, but Mama hid ours in the closet. We listen to it only for the BBC news. Sir Hayes sees me across the courtyard, but he keeps on playing. I don't want him to stop. When I'm close enough, I sit down cross-legged at his feet. I feel like a small frog before a secret prince. I look up at Serhei's deep set eyes, his delicate fingers holding his violin and bow. The music makes everything else. The dirty alley, the shouts and screams fade slowly away. When Serhei is done, he lifts his violin from his shoulder. Seeing his bright yellow star jolts me back to here and now. I touch my star to make sure it's where it's supposed to be. Sarah places his violin in its case, closes the cover, and clicks the latch shut. I follow Sarah into the two rooms where his whole family lives and works. The first room is the only one with a window. That's where Uncle Model and my big cousin Maurice work on their noisy knitting machine. Above it is a loft where the younger children sleep. The second room is where everyone eats, washes, cooks, plays, reads, and gossips. A long table fills the center with chairs around it and beds on the side. At least one lamp glows there all the time. Aunt Miriam's sweet-smelling onion soup simmers on the stove. Maurice lifts me up to see their calendar. It has a joke printed on it for every day of the year. The waiter puts coffee on the man's table, Maurice reads. It looks like rain, he says to his customer. Tastes like it, too, says the man. Everyone laughs. Fake wartime coffee is terrible. My younger cousins beg to see tomorrow's joke. No, says Maurice, let's save it. So Uncle Model shares a joke with us. Did you know Hitler's dog has no nose? He asks. No, says Charles. How does it smell? Terrible, says Uncle Model. Maurice pinches his nose. He pretends to march like a stick soldier. Sarah, Charles, Serhey, and I all fall in line behind him. Around and around the table we go. Aunt Miriam helps little Henriette clap time for us. The soldiers are scary. The alley is dirty. My cousin's apartment is dark and crowded. But when we're together, nothing can stop us from having fun. There is a picture of little Henriette, her cousin. Angels and Demons. One Thursday, my boy cousins aren't home. Sarah whispers but they, that they have gone swimming, even though it's forbidden. Can you girls take Henriette for a walk? Aunt Miriam asked Sarah and me. But where can we go? Parks, cafes, and museums are forbidden to do too. So we just wander along the main street. We look in all the shop windows. Let's play a game, says Sarah. We can each choose one thing from every window, but only one. We've played this game before. It's like shopping, but without any money. Our favorite place is the chandelier shop. So many lights glittering with diamonds. Henriette wants them all. Don't be silly, Henriette, Sarah says. How could we fit all those lamps over one table? 
When we reach the doll hospital, Henriette studies ladies, babies, clowns, and sailor dolls. Then she frowns. What if you don't come back right away for your doll? Will the doll doctor give it to someone else? Never, says Sarah. The doctor knows everyone must have her own doll. Henriette nods. But soon she grows thirsty and begins to whine. We go to a cafe and ask for water. The barman stares at our stars and says nothing. Sarah puts money on the bar. I don't sell water, says the barman. Go away, I can't serve you. Henriette starts to cry. We don't know what to do. We know Jews must never make a fuss. When we pass a small basement library, Sarah thinks of a way to stop her sister's crying. Look, she says to me, you and I are wearing the star, but Henriette isn't. If she were alone, they couldn't tell she's Jewish. They'd let her in. You can't leave her alone, I say. Of course not, says Sarah. Just watch, you'll see. Henriette peers through the library window. You go down first, Henriette, says Sarah. The librarian will see you are alone and ask you questions. Don't answer right away. She'll try to make you feel good, show you picture books. Maybe she'll offer you a drink. When she's busy with you, Odette and I will come down. Clutching the handrail, chubby little Henriette walks down to the library all by herself. Sarah and I wait a few minutes, then go down the steps into the library too. The librarian spots our yellow stars. She drops the book she's showing to Henriette. Sarah picks it up and hands it to her. Are you her mother? The librarian asks Sarah. My cousin's big for 13. No, says Sarah, I'm her sister. I thought I lost her, but I know how much she loves books. I thought she might be here, and here she is. Henriette gazes up at, at her big sister like an innocent angel. Sarah, will you read to me, she asks, please. The librarian's eyes dart around quickly. No one has seen us or our yellow stars. All right, she says. She flutters her hands toward the picture book corner. Take the children over there and stay there. I'll be at my desk. You're so kind, says Sarah. Open books cover our stars like shields. Henriette forgets she is thirsty. The librarian, our gatekeeper, pretends we are children like any others. All afternoon we read fairy tales. In our cave of bookshelves, we feel safe from the evil giants marching down the street. See if we have time to read this next one. This is called Lies. Someone's crying. The sound of it pulls me from my dreams. I open my eyes. It's still dark. I go to the window and push open one shutter, just a crack. I look down and see little one-armed No. Noel, I think is how you pronounce it. Noah, probably. His mother, Leah, helps him put on his jacket. Rumpled people are being herded down the street. They all carry bags and bundles. A bearded man stumbles and a policeman pushes him along. All the people are yellow star people. All of them are Jewish, like me. Madame Marie bursts in. She wakes Mama by pulling the blankets off her bed. Hurry! She says the police are coming. They're filling trucks with Jews. Mama and I pull our dresses on as fast as we can. Mama grabs a coat and shoes and we fly down the spiral staircase. Madame Marie pushes us into the broom closet inside her small work room. She shuts the door just in time. The doorbell rings. Loud men trudge into the hallway. We're rounding up foreign Jews, they say. We're going to rid France of them forever. Wonderful, says Madame Marie. Those Jews have taken our jobs and money for too long. Then she offers them a drink to toast their courage, she says. Frozen inside the dark closet, Mama and I cannot see, but we can hear. Madame Marie and the men are just outside the door. If the door were open, I could touch them. Mama's fingers find my yellow star. Silently, stitch by stitch, she begins to rip it off. I listen hard. I hear the sound of drinks being poured. Glasses clink in a toast. Chairs scrape around Madame Marie's table, only a reach away from our hiding place. The men boast and laugh. Suddenly, someone says to Madame Marie, where are your Jews? His companions fall silent. Our bodies stiffen. Our breathing all but stops. Long gone, says Madame Marie. They ran away to their country house. Good riddance to them, I say. More drinks are poured. But then stern more words. You know, madame, if you lie to us, you'll be sorry. 
one man warns her, will pack you into a truck along with them and send you far away. My godmother sounds insulted. Me? Do I look like a friend of Jews? I'm confused. How could she say such terrible things? She is our friend, one of our best friends. But suddenly I know she's lying. She's saying bad things about Jews to keep us safe. The same voice, still stern. Just to be sure, we'll go up to their apartment. Mama grabs my hand, squeezes it too tight. But Madame Marie keeps the men away from our just slept in sheets and blankets. Oh, you don't want to do that, she says. You know that though, that they are filthy. When they were living there, I'd knock on their door only when I had to. I'd say what I had to say quickly and hold my breath as long as I could. Then I'd run back down the stairs as fast as my old legs would carry me. Don't go up there if you don't have to. Their apartment still stinks to high heaven. Anyway, our bottle's nearly empty. Why not help me finish it? We wait, cold bare toes pressed tight to the floor. The smell of sour mops is all around. My body shakes hard, but I don't make a single sound. Finally, the loud men push their chairs back to the table. Merci, madame, they say. Au revoir. Heavy footsteps echo through the hallway. The doors slam. Silence. Madame Marie frees us from the closet. How can I thank you? Mama asks Madame Marie. She takes my godmother's hands in her own. Madame Marie shrugs. She needs her hands back to clear away the glasses. No time for that. We must get Odette to the railroad station as we planned. I look up at my mother. You'll come with me, won't you, Mama? I ask.